Welcome to Nature's Guardians. I'm Micah Siegel. Today, I have a very special guest. I'm talking with Tyler Cowan from Emergent Ventures. Welcome to the show, Tyler. Happy to be here. Thank you for having me on. Mm -hmm. Great to have you, too. First, I want to thank you for the very generous grant from Emergent Ventures, which will help me go to Africa next spring to see and film animals. We're planning that trip now. I think you went on safari last summer, didn't you? That's correct. To Maasai Mara in Kenya. That was a wonderful experience. I bet it was. Which animals did you enjoy watching the most? Elephants, to me, are always amazing because they're so smart. They mourn their dead. They communicate emotion. They act in groups. But just to see leopards, which are hard to see there, I didn't necessarily expect that I would come across them. Cheetah, just how flimsy they, they came across. The wildebeest, they're so strong and pushy and nasty. And in their presence, you feel that. So you, I could go on and on, but really all the different animals I saw made a very big impression on me. Uh, just baby giraffes are beautiful and graceful. Uh, they seem vulnerable, but many of them survive, of course. Sounds like a great trip. We're going to South Africa, uh, Botswana great. and Ni what, not Niagara Falls, uh, Victoria? Victoria, right? In Zimbabwe, yes. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have a pet? Uh, yes. Right now, my wife and I take care of our daughter's dog called Spinoza. He's a miniature Australian shepherd. When I was growing up, we had two dogs and also a series of cats. I had a gerbil, an ant farm, but that's basically my pet history. Wow, you've got a lot of pets. Not as many as a lot of people, but some. My father yeah. loved animals, and he wanted us to get a St. Bernard, but my mother vetoed that, which was probably a good thing. So For you once they drool too much and you should just get a smaller and more manageable dog. And I think she was the more sensible of the two on that issue. Do you prefer dogs or cats? It depends at which margin. So the dog we watch now, Spinoza, he's very well trained. He has a wonderful temperament and he's super intelligent, smarter than a cat. So I'm happy with him. I think I grew up as more of a cat's person. But I don't wish that instead of Spinoza, I had a cat. So maybe now I've evolved into a dog's person, but only smart trained dogs because a bad dog is worse than a bad cat. A bad cat will just leave you alone. Yeah. I have a pet per I What was that? I have a pet bird named Fruity. Here he is right now. He's been here like the whole time. He's, He's a, a yellow sign. Bird. Yeah. Thank you. He has a lot of colors and more on the front. He's just a little shy. How so smart do you think he is? Oh, I don't know how to measure smartness of animals, but uh, he can say a couple words. So I think that's pretty good for an animal. Can he say supply and demand? No, I wish he could. That would be fun. That would be good to teach him that. Then he could answer every question like an economist. Supply and demand. Yeah, he would be on the news. That would be fun. Yeah. So speaking of pets, I want to talk with you today about animals and regulation. Is it fair to say you're generally against government regulation? Generally is a very tricky word there. Uh, I do think governments should do more to limit cruelty to animals. Now, that's a specific case. I would say there are way more areas where I would like to see less regulation rather than more. But in that particular instance, even just to better enforce the laws we have on the books, I don't even know if you'd call that regulation, but I would favor that. So speaking of regulation, you've written that extra large bully dogs should be banned in the UK. Can you talk about why? They're dangerous. They've killed a certain number of people. And often, at least in the UK, the US is different, but they're used by gangs for intimidation. So it seems to me from a utilitarian point of view, which I would apply to this particular issue, the UK would be better off with no bully dogs. They also give dogs in general a bad name. And the people who genuinely want canine companionship, I think they can and should buy other breeds. So there's transition problems. What do you do with the bully dogs that people own currently? You grandfather those in, and over time, you end up with no bully dogs. But I do think that would be a better country over the Atlantic. So I want to talk with you about numbers of animals and how you think we should treat them. A number of animals, not numbers. Numbers. The oh. questions are interrelated. Okay, so let's start with zoos. There are 10 to 15,000 zoos in the world. 
Like some other industries, zoos follow a 20-30-50 pattern. 20% of zoos are great. They belong to the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums. They give money for animal conservation. They educate, are profitable, and keep animals in good condition all year round. 30% of zoos are not bad, but not good. And 50% of zoos are small, marginally profitable, and don't take good care of the animals. Given that, what do you think should be done about zoos that don't meet the criteria of the top 20%? I have mixed feelings about all zoos, but what you're calling the bottom 80%, I think we should discontinue them. I think they're cruel to animals. They don't encourage people who see the zoos to treat animals better. And maybe over time, the countries that have the zoos, they tend to be poor countries. But as they grow richer, maybe they can aspire to join the 20%. Now, even the 20% of quite good zoos, I think on net, I would prefer we have them. But I feel bad about them. There is a kind of slavery involved. But species are going extinct. Zoos are important for keeping some species going. And people need to see a lot of animals to actually want to preserve them. So I do think I would grudgingly admit the need for that 20% of zoos. Let's talk about pets now. In general, I'm giving figures for the United States. There are at least 60 million cats and 80 million dogs. More than 2 million dogs and cats are killed each year because their owners don't want them anymore. Do you think something should be done? It sounds to me like there's a misallocation of resources, but I don't off the top of my head have a good answer uh, for that problem. So ideally, the market in cats and dogs should clear. But if, you know, what is called the carrying costs of the animal exceed its liquidity premium, maybe the market price just isn't positive. So it sounds to me like something is wrong, but I don't have a good answer. Okay. So there are about 75 million fish as pets in the U.S. Many exotic fish are wild caught and smuggled in illegally. Thoughts? I would need to know more about the facts. But I would wonder if some of that trade shouldn't be legalized so that it would be more legitimate, it would be safer, and it would be easier to have secure property rights in these rare species, and that might help keep them going. Now, it depends. There's a cost and a benefit. If you legalize the trade, there'll be more of it. You might drain away some critical mass from the native habitat, and that's where it gets to the point where I would need to know more about the facts. But it does seem to me when it comes to animals and property rights, we sometimes make things illegal just because we disapprove without thinking through all the secondary consequences of that decision. So there are about 20 million pet birds, like this one, mostly parrots, who live 20 years or so. Many birds are unwanted after some period. Rescue facilities say they can't take any more birds. Some people say birds should not be pets at all. And yet I have a pet parrot named Fruity, and he's very happy. But I'm sure many birds are not well cared for as they get older. What do you think should be done? In nature itself, birds are not necessarily well cared for, right? That's an underlying thing we need to realize when we discuss a lot of issues of animal welfare. The default in nature is a kind of Malthusian equilibrium with a lot of predation, a lot of premature death, a lot of pain, suffering. It can be torture, starvation. The alternative to how humans treat animals is not typically so wonderful. So again, I think it depends on the exact bird you're talking about. Uh, I don't think we should ban ownership of birds. A lot of birds are taken good care of, and there's a property right in the bird, and that works out well for everyone. Now, might there be things we could do at the margin that would limit the number of excess birds we need to dispose of? Uh, I would favor looking into that, but again, I don't feel I have a good idea off the top of my head. So if I could eliminate all pet birds, so all the birds that exist in the world would be wild, I'd be willing to give up my bird to make that happen, even though he's very happy and he's cleaning his feathers right now. And because I think a lot of birds aren't very well cared for and would rather be in the wild, even if the wild is maybe even harsher, it's still their natural habitat and where they're supposed to be. And I think people just, they think, yeah, we'll take care of the bird. It, he'll be fine. but 15 years later, they're, it's a big commitment to have a bird since they live so long. So it's hard to say exactly. But Yeah, I think I worry if we banned ownership of birds, it would just lead to fewer birds. And a bird would rather be owned than dead, on, on average at least. I don't think too many people torture their birds. Over a million snakes are kept as pets in the U.S. 
Researchers believe that more than 70% of snakes are wild caught and 70% of snakes die before they even reach stores. According to one study, 75% of snakes die within one year, many from stress related to captivity. And yet you can actually order them by mail. Do you think snakes should be legal to buy and sell? My immediate inclination is to think it would be better if there were not private ownership of snakes. Again, I would like to know more about it, but based upon those facts, it seems to me there's a stronger case for banning snakes than for banning birds. But that said, snakes seem to be much less intelligent than birds, and perhaps they also suffer much less, or they suffer, but in a less meaningful way. So I'm less worried about getting the snakes right than the birds right. Americans own about half a million ferrets. Should it be legal to buy and sell ferrets? I would want to know data on how many of those ferrets are taken good care of, what they're used for. Out in nature, ferrets, is that a Malthusian equilibrium? Or is there some kind of scarcity of ferrets that if we put more ferrets out there, they would simply live happily? I don't, on the surface of it, see a great case for owning ferrets as pets. It just seems like a kind of weird mistake to me. People think it's cool. And then they get a ferret. They don't know what to do with it. They're poorly prepared. Whereas if you get a dog or a cat, while there's plenty of abuse, there's a whole set of normal paths you can take. Support networks, your friends have dogs and cats. You more or less know how that's going to go. It seems more stable to me. Americans own about 5 million hamsters and guinea pigs. Thoughts? What's the life expectancy of a hamster or guinea pig? Just a few years? Two or three years. Maybe that works out okay then. You give the kid... A hamster as a starter pet, the kid learns how to take care of something, they graduate to a more ambitious pet. Again, I'd like to know more about the facts, but I can at least see more of a case there for allowing the ownership. What do you think about breeders who make their living breeding animals? Many purebreds, for example, have significant genetic problems. Should breeders be regulated? This gets into Derek Parfit-like problems. So if you breed, say, a, a new kind of dog or a new kind of horse, but those are beings that otherwise would not have existed. So they might have some problems, but as long as their lives are worth living, I'm not too upset about that. So when you say regulated, I definitely believe in animal cruelty legislation. Uh, but I don't want to have very specific regulations on what kind of, say, dog you would be allowed to breed. Uh, there, I would rather see laissez-faire. And it seems to me we've bred a whole bunch of dogs, bully dogs, being an exception where I would ban them on grounds of violence. But a lot of these dogs are very useful. So German shepherds help out people who are blind. Some dogs are very friendly. Other do dogs herd sheep and so on. And that's the result of deliberate breeding. So I would doubt if the government would do a better job managing that than the private sector. Here's an economics question. Can you explain Say's law? And do you think Say's law applies to the pet trade? Say's Law was a proposition from the early 19th century French economist Jean-Baptiste Say, and it said supply creates its own demand. Now, that's a little obscure, but Say meant it as a kind of macroeconomic proposition. He doubted the possibility of overproducing all goods and services because he thought the income generated by producing some goods and services would create demand for other goods and services. So that's Say's Law. I don't think it has much direct relevance the most micro issues or issues involving animals. I don't think you necessarily can sell everything you make. I would say at the micro level, supply does not create its own demand. Now let's talk about lab animals. More than 100 million mice and rats are killed in U.S. laboratories every year. They're designed for experiments and often experience pain. Think about it from the point of view of the mice. What changes should be made here? I'm not sure I would make significant changes. A lot of those experiments seem to me quite useful on the biomedical side. I think over time, we'll be able to replace them with greater computational tools. We already see that happening, but I would not want any kind of blanket ban on, say, mice, rats being used in the laboratory for research. 100,000 primates are killed each year for experiments. Even though it's highly regulated already, these animals are in small cages with low quality of life for their entire lives. Do you think primates are different from other animals? Primates have a greater claim to having rights, but it's also the case in some limited set of experiments, they're more useful. So for instance, the use of macaque monkeys to test early stage vaccines during the pandemic, uh, that struck me as the right thing to do. 
because it ended up saving literally millions of human lives. But I strongly suspect there are many cases where it's not so justified. Now, I don't know how to construct a regulatory regime that would do a better job ex ante of distinguishing between those two cases, but it strikes me as something worth putting a lot more effort into. Now animals for entertainment. So worldwide, 3,000 elephants are used as entertainment for tourist shows. Have you ever seen one of those shows? When I was a kid, I saw some, yes. What did you think of them? I thought it was cruel and I didn't enjoy it. And I was even pretty young then. So I don't know whether or not we should ban that, but I think people should just stop going. I think it's a bad idea. I don't even think it's that fun. And I think a lot of kids are disturbed when they see what goes on rather than delighted. About 3,000 dolphins and 65 orcas are used in shows and experiences. Again, the 20-30-50 rule probably applies. Have you seen any of these shows? Oh, I think I did once a long time ago. Yes. What do you think of that? From what I saw, the dolphins had relatively good living conditions. That might have been misleading. And I always wonder when I see animals on public display, if this doesn't help the cause of the animal more generally, because people start getting worried about, say, dolphins being caught in tuna fishing nets, and that if they never see a dolphin, they won't so much have that worry. So I'd like to know more about it. I would consider that trade-off, but I do see some benefit, even for the dolphins, to having those shows. Let's talk about animals and sports. So 30 to 60 million horses are ridden by humans for entertainment. They use metal bits in their mouths and tight straps around their bellies. A heavy human sits on their spine, and many are ridden whether they feel like riding or not. I think the situation is pretty extreme for the horse's point of view. What do you think? I would like to know how much the horses enjoy or do not enjoy that experience. In theory, we can discover that using neurodata. If not today, I would think in the relatively near future. I would put my opinion on hold, and if it turns out it's torture for the horses, then I wouldn't want us to be doing it. But I'm not convinced it is. I think a lot of animals like challenges, just as human beings. At least some of them enjoy endurance sports or just play an old athletic competition. But when it comes to these horses, I just don't know. How many horses do you think are used in horse racing worldwide? I would guess, I don't know, five million, but I really don't know. It's half a million horses. Okay, so I was way off by 10x. Yeah. Half a million horses are used in horse racing worldwide. It's not done for the benefit of the horse. It's all about money. What do you think about horse racing? Again, one has to think those horses are being fed. And if it wasn't for the racing, those horses would not have been raised in the first place. So I would like to know if the life of those horses is better than no life at all. I suspect it is. Again, I'd like to know more about it. But my inclination is to think that it's okay and that the horses on net benefit from being used for that purpose. At least 50,000 dogs are used in dog racing. Is that different from horses? Those dogs are kept alive. From the previous data you gave me, there was a suggestion that a lot of dogs are not kept alive. They're put to sleep or abandoned. So unless those dogs are tortured on a very regular basis, even though the dog racing does seem cruel to me, it seems to me better for the dogs that we have it than that we ban it. What about bullfights? How many bulls are in bullfights? So if we didn't have bullfights, would those bulls just be absorbed into the regular bull population? That would be my first question. I would just say people should stop going to bullfights. It's a bad idea. No one makes us go. Let's just not do it. Yeah, there's 10,000 bulls in bullfighting. But could be that such a small number that if we didn't have bullfighting, they wouldn't all be killed. They would just drain off into the regular population, not really affect the market price, and things would continue. But of course, they would end up dead for other reasons. So you have to do this in a comparative way. Okay, let's talk about hunting while my bird is trying to get in my shirt. So yes. have you ever been hunting, Tyler? No, I've never been hunting. I don't want to go hunting. Okay. Hunting and fishing are never fair. The animal always loses. In the U.S., the annual, annual death toll includes 50 million fish, 28 million quail, 25 million rabbits, 20 million pheasants, 14 million ducks, 6 million deer, and tens of thousands of geese, bears, moose, elk, foxes, coyotes, and other creatures. 800 polar bears are shot and killed each year, and that's just the hunters with permits. Many states promote hunting, 
make money on licensing, and work to make sure that there are enough deer and fish available. What do you think about this? There's a lot of different issues in there. First would be with some animals, at least people have claimed to me that hunting them is useful to prevent a population crash. I don't feel I can, from this distance, evaluate that claim, but it seems likely to me at least some of the time that will be true. So to have a deliberate culling of some animals probably is useful, and sometimes governments do that on purpose. I view fish as quite a different case from most mammals. It seems to me fish don't have really meaningful lives. They're probably going to die painful deaths anyway. If we fish a fish from the wild, there's a problem of overfishing, which I would try to remedy. But I don't really on that feel bad for the fish. It just seems to me uh, they had a bad lot to begin with, and it's okay to fish them. So it's going to depend on the animal, on the circumstances, and on a number of other matters. So I would look at each on a case-by-case basis. The hunting of the polar bears, I wonder if we should allow that at all. I would think it would be better if we simply didn't hunt them and that they were a more strictly protected class of mammal. My dad says I should say a lot of those permits are given to indigenous tribes because it's their culture to hunt polar bears. I would put less weight on that than many people would. Now, if those people genuinely need polar bear meat to survive, I would allow it. I suspect in most cases that is not actually the state of affairs. Next, animals in medicine production. At least a million cows and pigs are killed to produce heparin each year. While that number is going down, it's still a lot of animals. Your thoughts? What are the uses for heparin and what are the substitutes for heparin? I'm pretty sure they're blood thinners, and these days you can get synthetic ones. I don't know the substances. Yeah, I don't know how good the substitutes are, so I would just look at it from that basis. How necessary is it? I don't object in principle, uh, but I would gladly do a lot to spur medical innovation for, say, synthetics, so that over time we could stop doing that altogether. Horseshoe crabs have special blue blood. 500,000 are bled each year for drug testing, and 20% of those die. Doesn't bother me. Bring it on. Okay. Let's talk about food next. To start, how many chickens do you think there are in the world? Oh, it's some massive number. I read this not too long ago, and I don't remember, but it's hundreds of millions, right? Maybe more. Want me to answer it? Sure. Is it billions? There's 8 billion people on Earth. Does that help? Yeah. A person, they eat a lot of chickens in a year, so... Yeah, the number of chickens is going to be really high. The answer is 33 billion. Yeah, that's a lot. I think we should eat more beef and less chicken meat for reasons that have been well explained by Peter Singer and others in the effective altruism movement. Because one meal of chicken basically kills a chicken, but it takes a lot of meals of beef to kill a cow. Last week, Americans ate 46 million Thanksgiving turkeys. How many turkeys do you think there are killed in? the U.S. each year? I don't know. Turkey's a funny meat. It's hard to estimate. A uh, hundred million? It's 200 million. Okay. How many pigs do you think are in the U.S.? Pigs in the U.S. I would guess that's, I don't know, five times the number of people. Should I answer? Sure. 72 million pigs. Oh, that's a much smaller number than I would have thought. Yes. I guess it takes a fair number of bacon packages to make up a pig. How many cows do you think are in the U.S.? 150 million? 30 million cows. About half are in feedlots. Okay, smaller than I would have thought. I've done too many drives through Nebraska. What do you think about feedlots? They should be more humane. So the innovations by people such as Temple Grandin make a lot of sense to me. People are going to eat meat, in my opinion, and I think they'll be eating it centuries from now. So we want to make the whole thing as painless as possible. How do you feel about how farm animals are treated in general? I think we should have much stricter regulations on factory farms that would raise the price of meat. That's overall a good thing. So I think that's an area where we could make very large improvements. You feel Americans eat too much meat? Aggregating is tricky. Americans could do better by eating more beef and less chicken and less meat, but it depends what they replace it with. So I don't want to replace it with junk food. And I recognize also that if you plow the field of greens, you kill the field mice. So you need to be careful what you're advocating as a replacement. But done intelligently, it seems to me there are ways we could eat less meat, more beans, more tofu, 
more of the right kind of vegetables done properly, and basically everyone would be better off. Per capita, Americans are in fifth place among nations for meat eating. Which four countries do you think eat more meat per capita than Americans? I would think Central Europe, maybe also Brazil. Which are they? Number one is Denmark, two is New Zealand, three is Luxembourg, and four is Cyprus. Okay, Cyprus surprises me. Maybe they don't grow vegetables that well on Cyprus. Let's see how much you know about seafood. The Monterey Bay Aquarium lists which seafood you should buy and which to avoid. We'll start with shrimp. For each shrimp, tell me if it's good to buy or avoid. And Dad, tell me how many Tyler gets right and wrong. Brown rock shrimp from the Gulf of Mexico. I don't know. I find when I buy shrimp in the supermarket or most restaurants, it just doesn't taste good to me, for one thing. So I basically don't buy it. One can calculate how good is it for the shrimp, the supply of shrimp over fishing. But unless you're somewhere like, say, Sri Lanka, where the shrimp is freshly caught, there's just not much reason to buy shrimp. So I don't do it. What do you think of brown rock shrimp of Gulf of Mexico? Good to buy or avoid? I would say avoid, but I don't know about that particular case. It's good to buy. So he got that one wrong. That's one wrong. Okay. If it tastes bad, it's not good to buy, right? So <laughs> I buy it. Yeah. Your beans, beans with cumin. Curried spinach. They're excellent. Okay, next. Pink shrimp from Gulf of Mexico. Again, shrimp, I'm just going to say no. I don't know the differences. Okay, across... we're, we're forgetting so the all, shrimp. All shrimp, I'm going to say no. We're on the fish now. Okay. So, amberjack. I don't know. Again, most fish in the United States doesn't taste very good to me. So I tend to save up my fish eating for when it's really fresh and not do the farm thing, not do the long supply chain thing. It's just not any good. And you don't know that much about the supply chain, I find. It's far from transparent. And I've spoken to people who work in major supermarkets and asked them about supply chain issues. And they say sometimes they don't know, even when they're trying their best. I would say like sardines and mackerel in cans are good fish to buy. And a lot of the rest doesn't make sense. So, abalone. I don't like the texture very much, but it's probably good. Yeah, good to buy. So, farmed striped bass. It's probably some kind of ecological catastrophe and it doesn't taste good, so don't buy it. It's good to buy. I mean, this isn't if it tastes good or not. This is just if it's good for the fish. Beans so, and cumin. Bring it on. Striped bass caught with gill nets. Probably bad. Yeah, clams. Probably good. Yes. And they're not intelligent, so they're not suffering. And they're at a point in the food chain where it's probably fine. Halibut from bottom trolling. Bottom trolling sounds like it's almost certainly bad. That's right. California spiny lobsters from traps or pots. I'd want to know how discriminating the traps and pots are, but I'm inclined to say no. It's good to buy. Okay. Blue, blue mussels. Probably good to buy. Yeah. Giant Pacific octopus. Octopuses are very smart, so I don't want to touch them. So no. Compared to other octopuses, that they're good to buy. Yeah. I, I don't agree with that. I think we should not eat any octopuses. Yeah, and the rest of the octopuses you should not buy. Orange roughy. That tastes so terrible. Never buy it. And it's at, it seems like one of these farm things that breeds like filth and disease. So I, I don't see the upside on any dimension. They're not easy to cook either. Eastern oyster. I don't love oysters. Probably it's fine, but I yeah, don't it get is. it. It yeah. is. Chinook salmon from New Zealand. I'd have to know more about it. There's a lot of overfishing of salmon in general, so I'll say a no, but with high, highly uncertain. It's actually best choice out of all of these. Okay. Farmed Atlantic salmon. Farmed salmon tastes bad. Don't do it. Don't do it. Yeah, it is an avoid. Swordfish. Hasn't there been massive overfishing of swordfish? So I'll say, limit what you do there. Don't do it. Generally, it's a buy, but not from drifting long lines or nets. Okay. Thresher shark. I don't know. Is there a way of catching them without a lot of other collateral damage on other beings? That's what I'd want to know. So for now, I'll say no. They're okay to buy. Okay. Mako shark. This is the last one. Okay. I'll say no. Right. What's the difference? I don't know. He got exactly half and half. Yeah. He got eight right and eight wrong. He got eight right and eight wrong. Yeah. Okay. Pretty good. As I said, my actual algorithm 
is to limit fish eating to when I'm traveling and in places with fresh local product for the most part, not a hundred percent. So those are my as expressed in action answers. We're almost done. Now let's talk about wild animals. Every year, a hundred million sharks are killed just for their fins, so Asian people can show off their status with shark fin soup. In 2012, the Chinese government declared that shark fin soup would no longer be served at official banquets. More than 50 countries have banned shark fin trade, yet the number of sharks killed has not gone down. Despite Yao Ming asking the Chinese people to stop, they continue to demand shark fins. What are your thoughts? I don't at all favor the availability of shark fin soup. So in that sense, I'm sympathetic. But when you're talking about a predator, you also need to make the whole calculation. And this gets into why maybe sometimes I'm skeptical about other people's analyses. So if there are fewer sharks, sharks brutally murder a lot of other creatures. You might want fewer predators in nature. Again, that's itself hardly the whole calculation. I don't think shark fin dishes are that wonderful. They're mostly status seeking, pretty zero sum or negative sum as a social game. So I'm fine with not having it, but I would be cautious before leaping in and thinking like we had the whole calculation figured out, you've got to count more than just the sharks. Every year, at least 20,000 African elephants are killed for their tusks. This number is decreasing, but it's still alarmingly high. And it takes a lot of money to protect elephants from poachers. I think elephants should be much more protected. But there's, for me, an open question whether that's best done through a kind of com indirect community ownership arrangement or direct private property rights or government regulation. In Kenya, it's gone pretty well and the elephant population has come back. And that's because they've worked with local communities that in essence have the right to earn income from the elephants, even though they don't own the elephants outright. In some other cases, you might just want to allow private ownership of the elephants. Each year, 450 rhinos are killed for their horns, partly for Chinese medicine, but also for sculptures. In Kruger National Park, one rhino is killed every single day. The poachers have almost unlimited resources because each single rhino horn sells for about $20,000. A small sculpture can sell for more than $100,000. What do you think here? I favor much stricter protection of rhinos, but I recognize we've already tried that. It hasn't exactly worked, though. So it's a tough one. We should protect rhinos more. What do you think about reducing the demand for the rhino horns in the first place? If we can do it, that'd be wonderful, but that's begging the question. It's like waving a magic wand and making the problem go away. But of course, no one should buy that stuff. It doesn't work. So I hope we can protect more rhinos, but some are on the verge of extinction with very limited numbers, kept alive essentially by zoos, which gets back to one of your earlier questions. And we failed the rhinos. I hope they can come back. Not all rhinos are doing terribly. The Javan and Sumatran rhinos are both under a hundred individuals at this point, but the white rhino has over 15,000 individuals and the black rhino has 7,000 individuals. So I'd say the Javan and Sumatran rhinos are pretty screwed, but not the others. Each year, 150 tigers are killed by poachers for their bones, which are ground up and put into pills. This is already illegal, but it continues. We should protect tigers much more. Again, they're at a place in the food chain where you have to wonder whether other changes in the environment have made them unsustainable. But let's do our best, I would say. There's no reason to allow those trades to go on. No good reason. Last, about 10,000 bears are farmed in Vietnam because people believe bear bile has medicinal power. I'm sure you're aware of the doctrine of signatures. These bears live in tiny cages and are miserable their entire lives. I hope they stop it. How would they? I don't know what current Vietnamese laws are or enforcement is, but I would be shocked if it couldn't be made better. And as Vietnam is growing richer, they'll have the capacity to make it better. So now let's wrap it up. There are a lot of animals we didn't talk about today, but thank you for your interesting answers and thoughts. My interest is mostly in stopping poaching. On the supply side, the poaching business is run by powerful middlemen who fight to keep their business making millions. In these last few questions, I want to focus on demand. If Peter Thiel gave me $10 million to go stop poaching by stopping demand for all these animal parts in Asia, 
How would you say I should do that? I don't think $10 million would help you make a dent in that problem. And sometimes these things become higher status because outsiders are trying to ban it. So that's happened a bit in the Faroe Islands where they have the ceremonies where they kill the whales once a year. It's become a symbol of local pride that they do it and other places don't do it. And the attempt by outsiders to interfere arguably has backfired. I don't know. I think the best hope is those places get richer and learn more about medicine that actually works. And just like Americans no longer eat or consume a bunch of animal products because we're wealthier, I hope these other places go the same route. I don't know any way to really spend money and persuade them of that. The vast majority of this poaching is for status symbols, not for medicine, just a little bit for medicine. You want those societies to change over time and the status symbol to become a Tesla or a, a beautiful work of art instead of something from rhino horns or whatever. But that's a slow process. Like once it clicks into place, it happens pretty quickly because there's a sort of contagion effect, but it's very hard for outsiders to steer, I think. The problem is rich people in China. How can we stop them from demanding these status symbols? I think there's nothing America can do. Uh, I expect they'll evolve their way out of it slowly. So finally, what suggestions do you have for me about growing my podcast? Keep on doing it. Most of all, keep on learning about your area. Don't track your number of listens or downloads too closely. I think that's a bad incentive. And track how much you're learning pretty closely. I think that's a good incentive. Do it if you love it. If it stops making sense, give it up and then take up the next thing. That would be my advice. Thank you for talking with me today, Tyler. My pleasure. And thank you for watching. You can help animals by hitting the like button and subscribing to this channel. I'll see you next time on Conversations with Micah. Bye. It's Conversations with Micah. That was good. Thank you. Yeah, it'll be a good episode.